The objectives of this session will be introduce FSC's forces project for broader interest audience and secondly to explore the potential and values of forest certification for ecosystem services and landscape approaches. For this session we will have uh, two uh, panelists. Uh, please join us to give applause to Ms. Dita from WWF Indonesia. The second speaker will be Mr. Asir Monument, the director for Asia Pacific Regional FSC. Also, I acknowledge the presence of Mr. Kim Karstasin, the executive director of FSC. He is not, uh, he is not the speaker, but uh, we come forward to this uh, panel tables for a uh, resource person, just in case if the speakers cannot give a satisfied uh, answer. So we will refer to Mr. Karstin. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, without further ado, I would like to invite Mr. Asir Monuments for this uh, presentation. Floor is yours. Well, I'd like to welcome everyone to the session. And thanks um, a lot to CIFO for helping us put this out and also to the Ministry of Forestry in Indonesia. Um, I'm going to talk about FSC's project, Forces Project. Um, and there are a lot of people in the room, so I'm going to start off with a short introduction on FSC, just to explain what it is. Um, FSC is a global, independent, non-governmental organisation. It's been around for 20 years. Um, founded uh, after the Rio Conference on the state of Rome, and importantly by a balance of social, environmental and economic organisations. So we have this balance in our organisation where we have social members, environmental members, economic members, and they work together to try and find solutions to the problems of the world's forest. And what we do is we enable businesses and consumers and investors to make choices about the forest products that they buy in this business model. Well, it's That's the system that works all over the world. Okay. Cost? Yeah. Yes. So FSC does three basic things. We set standards for good forest management, but also for ecosystem services. We run an accreditation and certification system, a bit like ISO, whereby independent certification bodies use the standards that we create to issue certificates to the companies. Um, and then we have a product label, the FSC label, which goes on products and allows um, consumers and retailers and businesses to specify that these products are for a well managed forest. But that's designed to give a reward to the forest managers for improving what they do. And around the world, we have around 180 million hectares of forest certified now in 81 countries. Um, there's an increasing amount of certification in this region. I'm based in the Asian Pacific office in Hong Kong. We're seeing quite rapid growth in the certificates in this region. Uh, but we're still quite far behind other parts of the world in terms of certified area. Uh, importantly, we've been able to show that this forest management certification actually has an impact in the forest. So we've done lots of work, including recently with C4, we've been able to show real tangible, uh, measurable, positive impacts of forest management certification to the forest managers and also to biodiversity issues, also to carbon, also importantly to social and human rights and market rights issues. So that's a balance of social, environmental, economic, and it's actually having an impact in the forest with efficacy certification. Next slide. Um, and to get the products from the forest to the market, and uh, we have something called chain of custody certification, whereby every company, every organization between the forest and the retailer um, takes possession of a product, a certified product, 
has to have something called a chain of custody certificate. And this is the, the engine that drives the whole system. And this is very important. So we now have 28,000 companies around the world in over 110 countries who can buy and sell products with the agency level on them. And they can use those products to um, uh, specify that the company is trying to do the right thing about the products they're selling. But also that then creates the, the engine that drives the supply chain, which then creates the reward for the forest managers to get. Ecosystem services. We do forest certification. Why is it so important to talk about ecosystem services? Well, for us, we see that the um, value, the socioeconomic value of forests, are far greater than the actual value of the timber. And so, this we discussed a lot of this event and how do we integrate the wider values of forests into the habit of the forest. I think you see this is also very important. So, um, we have research done and we see the series of the untapped value of the ecosystem services. The, the value of timber from forests is relatively small compared to the other values that can be created in forests. And ecosystem services certification has the potential to provide business value to forest managers through payment of ecosystem services. That means certification can verify the provision of that service. So you can actually check if that service is being provided through the certification model. And also, in a similar way that we do with FSC certification, we can add value to that by providing market, providing safeguards, and through the whole supply chain, and reward the forest manager or community who works in the forest. That's fine. So, FSC already has uh, a strong basis for ecosystem services certification. It's not standards that we have at the moment. Um, our principles and criteria already talk about ecosystem services. Um, it's part of principle six. Um, and so we can integrate that already into what we do. That's like. So, for instance, um, if you're looking at biodiversity as your ecosystem service, it's already <coughs> through the whole way through doing responsible forestry, the intrinsic benefits through doing responsible forestry can measure with FC certification to biodiversity. Next slide. And the same with carbon. So FC certification and responsible forest management and already can provide carbon benefits. And uh, we've got studies shown in FC certified forests, um, where there is Reduced impact logging or well managed forestry, there is far more carbon stored in those forests than similar forests next door that aren't well managed. It's like, but FSC at the moment doesn't do certain things. Shit. Firstly, we don't have uh, specific management guidelines for ecosystem services in our standards. We don't have a methodology for quantifying ecosystem services or for evaluating their impact through our current standards. And at the moment, other than our regular certification label, we don't have a mechanism to reward ecosystem services explicitly. Our reward is for good forest management, we don't talk about explicit rewards for ecosystem services. So, we have this project called Forces, um, which is a pilot test to enhance the standards that we have so that they can be used for ecosystem services. Uh, we're working with Finance from UNEP and Global Environment Facility, um, and then with uh, partners such as uh, CIFOR, SMB, WWF, and other organizations. Uh, we have a global project that's run from our international office based in Germany, um, which does the standard development and market analysis work with a lot of support from CIFOR and that. Um, and then we have four countries where we're running this project. So we have Chile, uh, where we have um, uh, pilot sites being undertaken in collaboration with FSC Chile, but also with other organizations there. We have projects in Nepal with ANSAB, the FIFA Fund, um, which is working on pilot sites there. A few projects in Vietnam, working with the Ministry of Forestry in Vietnam, also with RECOF. 
led by SNP. And then we have purchase of Indonesia, which is a So through this process, we've come up with two simple uh, certification models, whereby we can try and use ecosystem services as part of that certification. The first one is having a single certification, whereby the standards, FSC standards are adapted to include the provision of ecosystem services. So uh, biodiversity, uh, tourism, or water retention is included in the verifiers of the FSC standard that is used on the ground. The other model is whereby there's a dual certification, whereby FSC would um, uh, verify external schemes that could provide that service, provide that verification. So, for instance, with forest carbon, we took it to the gold standard. Over here, actually, in the world. And we uh, have a standard for verifying carbon. And we've been working with them on a collaboration about how their standards can be compared to ours and how we can work together on dual certification. So, there's two models. One is to incorporate into what we and one is to associate with the And the expected results. Um, we'll have standards for the ecosystem services certification with additional requirements. We'll have new promotional claims that uh, businesses and companies and communities can use regarding the ecosystem services certification. We'll look to develop viable business models for marketing ecosystem services so that there's actually a market pool so that the system actually works and sustains itself, which is why FSC works. We'll have the system pilot tested, we have a monitoring and evaluation methodology, and we'll work with the market through our global network to try and sensitize the market to also looking for ecosystem services as well as good forest management as a result of the certification. And just some highlights where Peter's going to talk about what's happening in Indonesia. Um, but a key thing that we've done there is we've worked on our national standards in Indonesia. So we've Harmonized our certification body standards, so now on one standard. We're now working with LEI to develop a national forest standard for Indonesia with a local stakeholder group. So, adapting our international standards to the individual context. We've done a lot of work with C4 on analysis, and we have pilot sites, and some of these pilot sites are now FC certified. In Vietnam, we also have this standard development process going on. Been chaired by the Ministry of Forests. And also part of size there. Next slide. And in Nepal, similarly, we have a working group and working with lots of communities to look at ecosystem services. And things like uh, not just in biodiversity, but also things like ecotourism. So different types of services. In Chile, we've already done a work on the indicators, and that's been now incorporated into the local standard. And particularly there, we're piloting similar work that we've done on three primary four percent of the users through this process. And across the region, um, at the moment we have 11 countries that are developing national FSC standards for their countries. So doing that local stakeholder adaptation process to all that social and environmental climate change balance. And so that's happening all across the region. And that's being driven by the increase in supply of FSC certified products, but also the big increase in the demand for FSC certification. We now have more than a quarter of the FSC supply chain certification in the nation Pacific. So it's a big chunk of FSC. It's not just the supply chain, it's also the market. So the market for uh, sustainable ethical products is not just North America and Europe, it's also starting to be more and more in this region. And finally, we're doing lots of work on capacity building, training trainers, working with smallholders, directing funds to smallholder projects to try and help with this thing. So that's a brief introduction, and I'll now let Peter talk more about what's really happening on the ground in Indonesia. Thank you, Elizabeth, for your uh, interesting presentation. And we have this equipment on uh, environmental services certification. And now I would like to invite Ms. Tita from the WWF Indonesia to present the update on the uh, forces project in Indonesia. Thank you.
Um, my name is Idara Madani from WBMF Indonesia. And I would like to give a presentation about FORCES project. FORCES stands for Forest Certification for Ecosystem Services. Um, the full title of this project is Expanding FSC Certification at Landscape Level through Incorporating Additional Ecosystem Service. The project goal is to improve and promote sustainable forest management for a range of ecosystem services through the medium of FSC certification. Payment for ecosystem services for the PES will be the key element to mainstreaming the forest uh, biodiversity conservation. Forces project is supported supported by the GEF for a global environment facility, facilitated by UNEP, implemented by FSC with FSC partners in four different countries, in Indonesia it is led by WWF and C4 as the international partner for, for the whole project that is also located in Indonesia. In Vietnam it is led by SMB, in Chile it is led by FSC Chile and in Nepal it is led by Ansel. In Indonesia, we're partnering with Ministry of Forestry and the ALI, or Indonesian Eco Labeling um, Institute, with C4 as our international partner. Now, the biggest question for the FSC Pass certification is why matters, why we have to do this. Well, as you know, that um, forest offers a wide range of um, ecosystem services from tourism or recreation function to water, soil, carbon, and so many more. And it leads to the assumption that human consumption for natural forests is reducing ecosystem services such as soil and water. Therefore, we think that sustainable forest management providing higher ecosystem services values than non-sustainable forest management. If you see on the full title of the project, there's a word addition, there's a word expanding. It's because this project is trying to uh, give the additional or expansion for FSC certification. It means that the unit management that will be later certified with FSC pass is the unit management that they have to hold the usual or the traditional FSC certification. Another reason is that the appreciation. Another reason is that the appreciation for biodiversity and forest services are low. For example, like uh, in Indonesia, as a tropical country, uh, most of FSC certified natural forest concessions, they are already do a forestry services. Like by implementing the FSC scheme, they preserve the water, they preserve the soil, they preserve the carbon, but up to now, there's a very limited appreciation on that. So WWF, as a country partner, we expect by the end of this four-year project, we are now in the beginning of the third year project, um, we expect that in the end of the project, we can give a recommendation for FSC to have set up ES certification system that is credible, verifiable, applicable for even small holders, and replicable to other area in the world. And one of the key important role uh, that C4 can facilitate in this project as our partner is that to develop to help develop indicators. So right now I'm gonna run through and give a little bit of summary of three pilot sites. There are three area of pilot sites in Indonesia. The first one is in West Kalimantan, the second one in East Kalimantan, and the last one is Long Long Island. If you can read it, I give you uh, several um, actions that need to take um, by the country partners in this forces project. Among those, um, one of the most important thing is to conduct market analysis to see will it is too paid from potential past buyers or users because in the future we really want the certification to be paid, <coughs> real paid. That's why we need to find a real connection between the FSC pass certification um, with the potential buyers um, with a suitable um, pass business model. 
This is our first pilot site. It is located in Sasao and Sedal villages in West Lombok that covering 3,000 hectares. It is a, a local community and what we see in this pilot site is the water services. So the water services in West Lombok is already running since 2009 based on the local government regulation. If you can see there, it's a, it's a payment scheme since 2009. So the upstream community, they conserve the area in the foot of Rinjani Mountain by doing reforestation in order to preserve water quality and quantity. And the water is collected by PDAM. PDAM is a state-owned enterprise water company, so it's a water company owned by the government. And the PDAM also collect a monthly retribution to around 60,000 houses up to now. This is the example of the monthly water bill that the PDIM collected every month. The highlighted in yellow is the retribution for the ecosystem services. It costs 1,000 rupiah. What we see in this pilot site, because the water services and the mechanism of payment for ES is already running, um, what we need to do is we have to make a science-based verification to prove the impact of reforestation activities conducted by local community on the quality and flow of the water, improving monitoring and evaluation methodology through pest protocol to help expanding existing paid water services to water area in Lombok, because right now it's only running in the western part of Lombok, where the forces hopefully can shorten up the process and we are partnering with relevant stakeholders, of course, and we prepare, we prepare local community for FSC certification assessment. Next slide. Our second pilot site, it is located in Kapuas Hulu Corridor, in Kapuas Hulu District, West Kalimantan. So if you can see on the map, the green one is the Kapuas Hulu Corridor. It, it is called Corridor because it is an imaginary uh, corridor that uh, built to bridge the key species between two national parks, the Nausataru National Parks and the Tungkaribu National Parks. Next slide. In this area, what we are trying to see is the biodiversity-based ecotourism. It is one of the places where the um, subspecies for orangutan in West Kalimantan uh, live. What we see in the ecotourism value is that we're trying to improve existing ecotourism that has been running since 2010. One of the things is by collecting data on biodiversity such as orangutan, key or endemic fish species, hydrology, and the tourism package. We do a partnership with relevant stakeholders, the Forestry Service, National Park Authority Office, tour operator, and local government, and we prepare local community for FSC certification assessment. And this is our third pilot site. It is PT uh, Rata Timber, or Mold Rata. It is located in West Kutai, East Kalimantan, covers 95,000 hectares. Rata is an active natural forest concession and already got FSC certification on April 2012. What we see in Rata is the biodiversity and carbon value as the ecosystem services. Um, we help Rata Timber to maintain their FSC certification and implementation of producing by quality. The assumption is that because Rata is already certified, uh, Rata has higher carbon sequestering volume and biodiversity values compared to the non-sustainable FMU. That's why we're working with Kyoto University to conduct biodiversity and carbon assessment. And this is the 60 plot of the biodiversity and carbon that is the result is a collaboration between WWF and Petel uh, and Kyoto University. 
Well, among the highlights based on our milestones so far, um, based on the market analysis that are already completed in three pilot sites, there's a, a positive response from our respondents, from the potential buyers and users, is that they are willing to pay if there is an ES certification take place. That leads to the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rita, for your updates on the uh, forces project development in Indonesia. And uh, after having uh, listening carefully the two speakers, I am quite sure that uh, you have something in mind. Uh, want to be? I uh, want uh, to ask to the speakers to further knowing the uh, uh, subject matters. But before I'm opening the uh, discussion. I have uh, some points for clarification uh, to those uh, two speakers. Firstly, I would like to uh, give a, a short question to Mr. Alasirs on how FSC is uh, adapting to the landscape-based approach to forest management and uh, how managers and local people can uh, gain an economic benefit from the ecosystem services. So um, FSC has been looking at following the discussions on landscape approaches with lots of interest. And um, in our review of our principles and criteria, uh, which was completed in 2011, um, 12, um, there was a lot of discussion about incorporating more issues on the landscape level into those standards. And some of that was included into our global standards, particularly on um, social issues community issues. So we now have very, very good um, criteria for evaluating um, how forest managers are working with communities, working with social issues. Um, and some really good uh, guiding tools as well on free prior informed consent that can be used as part of that evaluation process. So that's built into our, our regular certification system. And with additional work on ecosystem services, um, we can add value to that whole thing using our existing systems. So we don't have to build something new, we can use our existing network and certification bodies, use our existing network of accreditation and certification, and also use our existing supply chains um, to build value for communities by using these additional indicators to verify something different, which is services. Um, traditionally, FSC was seen very much as focusing on the timber or the paper that was produced from the forest. Increasingly, we're seeing that that's not going to work. If we want to work at the landscape level, we need to look at other things in order to make ourselves maintain our relevance. So, looking at biodiversity or carbon or water, it's all part of the picture. We've heard a lot this morning about how moving to that landscape approach is going to be very important for us. And FSC sees that as well, in particular in this region. Well, if we try to work in Indonesia or in Malaysia or Vietnam or Nepal, um, you can't just look at the timber concession. In isolation, you have to look at the wider landscape and you have to look at the wider benefits. Otherwise, there's not going to be enough value there to maintain that forest, to maintain that. Okay, thank you very much, Asir. In principle, I think uh, the FSC certification is now beyond the uh, usual uh, timber certification. It's now expanding into the uh, environmental services to account of uh, economic and so, uh, social and economic aspect of the uh, uh, environmental services. Is that uh, the point? Um, we, we, we already include social, environmental, economic very, very strongly in our, in our applications. Um, but we're looking to expand um, the impact of what we do, so it's beyond just the timber. Yeah. So it's also looking at ecosystem services. We've had a lot of debate over the years about how much of a CC you get involved, particularly in carbon and red, and whether that's something that's credible for us to do. And this is one of the ways by which we're using our system to um, make an impact in the market, have a positive impact, using our existing networks, our existing tools, and then building on those so that we can have more of an impact in the forest. Okay, thank you very much. And, uh, well, 
I now turn to uh, Ms. Dita. Uh, well, I learned from your presentation that uh, the forces project in Indonesia is implemented in uh, three uh, locations. One is in the uh, West Kalimantan for biodiversity and ecotourism. And second is uh, in Lombok Island for water supply. And the third is uh, in East Kalimantan for biodiversity and carbon. So among the three pilot sites, which one is more potential to be FSC environmental services certified? Well, um, what we are trying to do in this uh, forces project is we're trying to develop a new standard. And there is no easy way in, in doing so. But um, in the forces project, time-wise, uh, our third pilot site, which is the Rata Timber, that already FSC certified, is the one that is uh, has a big potential to be the first uh, FSC test certified in the future. Um, but on our other two pilot sites in Lombok and West Kalimantan, the services are already there. What we need to do is to help the local community to be FSC certified, which is, we are going that way in this project. Okay, thank you, Lida. So, I think we got some uh, additional uh, information from my uh, previous question to this uh, two speakers. And I think it is time for me now to open the floors. And I would like to have uh, three uh, questions from the floor. And uh, I just want to remember uh, all of us that uh, we have a time until 2, uh, two o'clock eh? or uh, 5 past to 2. Yeah? Is that correct? So at least we will have a 2.45. Oh, still a lot of time. Eh? <laughs> I thought that we are in class, so I want to limit discussion but uh, since we have an ample of uh, times we will end at uh, 2 45 so it's quite enough for us to have an, uh, a quite long discussion now and uh, well for the first uh, round I will invite three uh, questions on the left side yes and then yes and two eh? so please identify yourself by mentioning your name and institution uh, my name is Jim Tarrant from Mengility IRG. Uh, my question has to do with uh, all the presenters. Uh, and specifically, once you get to the landscape level, um, you necessarily go beyond any individual project or company uh, uh, effort. And I'm wondering to what extent, particularly in the case of uh, Indonesia, have uh, the has MSC and the Forces Project in particular involved the Kabupaten or Kotamadya level governments in the, the whole process of uh, governance with respect to uh, landscape level management of the forest resources. Thank you. Thank you, James. And the second question would be, yeah, on the red scrum, the lady, yeah, with the red scrum. Thank you, good afternoon. My name is Baby from USA, USA Leaf, Lowering Emission in Ancient Forest. So my question is like, um, thank you for the presentation. First, uh, it's very interesting the one in. So the project in Rata, in Rata, it's very interesting. But then you are talking about the carbon and carbon and variable carbon crediting mechanism. So my question would be like the project boundary. It's not only about the boundary of the project or the company, but then uh, also what happened with the other landscape, sorry, other land use on the companies, like, I think for me, I guess it's one of the certifications that has a very comprehensive principle and standard, but then they're not including other land use around the company into the standard and the monitoring. So I think that would be interesting if we're also talking about that, because maybe in the term of carbon, there will be a late leakage and the activity will shift into other uh, into other areas. Thank you. Thank you, Vivi. And the third question. Yes. Thank you. My name is Bert. I'm from USA, Asian of Asia, based in 
Talks, and um, I have a question for um, Mr. Ms. Dinar, because you mentioned about you conduct a survey of willingness to pay, and I think if your information sharing would be more helpful for us for private sector investment strategy. I just like to know when you conduct this survey, you probably ask them also what is the key factor for decision making of willingness to pay. What you found like a significant factor when people decide for that, and for the one who decide not to pay, what are the reasons? Thank you, Bar. So we have a uh, three uh, person who address uh, three questions to uh, us here and to Dita. So I think uh, so uh, Dita first uh, will answer the question. Yeah, I think all the questions for me. <laughs> so uh, I will go uh, for to the first question. Thank you very much. Uh, your question is how the forces project or the FSC involved the Kabupaten or district government in this project. Well, for the water services, in Lombok, I have to you know answer it one by one at the time. Um, in Lombok, uh, the water services has been running since 2009, and it's based on the local government regulations number four, uh, year 2009. So since the very beginning, we involved the Kabupaten or the district uh, government for the water services. And um, in the forces project, we help all the stakeholders to develop a monitoring and evaluation to justify and to help uh, verifying that the local community who live in the upstream is preserving water quality and quantity for the urban people in Mataram City, in Lombok. And um, for the Kapuas Hulu pilot site, we also involve the Kabupaten because the corridor, it starts from the Putusiba office the Putusibao, I don't know if you are uh, familiar with it. Okay, you are familiar with the area. It starts from the Putusibao <coughs> until Planja. So it is almost on the border between Indonesia and Malaysia. And um, we also have a good uh, communication with the National Park Authority offices, which is the corridors between the two national parks. For the Rata Timber, I think the beginning of a uh, company operating, they should have a permit from the local government. So since the very beginning of the project, they already involved the district government. And in this project, we also involved uh, West Thai local government, especially for the forces project. And for the second questions, your question is how about other land use or landscape around the Tatiwe? Well, it's a, it's a rather complicated because around Tatiwe there's a mining company, there's a non-sustainable logging company, and a protection area. And each of those uh, land use has its own authority. So in this forces project, we only focus on the Rata Timber. And next, what we are going to do is we're going to compare between Rata Timber as a sustainable forest management to another logging concession that is not implemented FSC uh, forest management and reducing the logging to see uh, how much carbon sequestration uh, differences in the two concessions. And for the willingness to pay, it's been completed in three areas. So on the three areas, it has a different response for the ecotourism because uh, the ecotourism in 
in the Danau Sentarum in West Kalimantan is a very specific. It's a specific for hobbyists, uh, for people to go fishing and enjoying scenery and people that want to see orangutan. That's why they don't really mind to pay. I mean, all of our respondents say that. The water, right now, the water services only paid by households. So in the market analysis, we try to reach out corporates, uh, hotel chains, to get their response if once these ES certifications take place, what are the response about it? And they said they are willing to pay for the ES certification product, although we haven't touched the price. And for the carbon, it's a little bit complicated because um, many of our respondents, they are more, you know, give critical to the current RADD situation in Indonesia, but some corporates that is not directly uh, working in the forestry sector, they are feeling, uh, willing to pay for carbon. It's from the airline companies. Thank you, Lita. And now Mr. Kim, would like to add? Yeah, I, I just thought it was worth maybe mentioning that when we think about ecosystem services as part of what FSC can contribute to, the starting point is to see what do we have already? What is already in our standards, in our policies, and in our practices that is relevant for ecosystem services? And there is quite a lot. We already have good systems for stakeholder engagement. We already have professionally working certification bodies. We already have high conservation values protected in the certified areas. We already have a lot of uh, considerations for social issues. We're working on free pride for consent, etc. So there's already a lot that we have. And I think what the challenge is there is to be able to measure it better, to be able to measure and demonstrate the actual impact of certification on the ground on these issues. So that I think is in itself a first set of issues that we are dealing with. What do we have already and how do we measure that better? Then I think there's a whole range of secondary issues which are enormously important. Because if we want to deal with ecosystem services, then it is completely correct. We cannot just look at the forest management unit. We need to look beyond that and see what the broader system implications are in the ecosystem setting. Uh, so therefore, we need to look at how do we then make sure that what we have already gets relevant in the broader issue and the broader setting of the landscape. And then the second set of issues is about how do we make it economically viable to do this, to do these things. How do we make it something that has a, a, a market value? And that, I think, is what the Forces Project is struggling with. And those are sort of the three dimensions that we are primarily looking at. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kim, for your additional information. And now I'm uh, opening the second round of our discussion. Again, from the left side, yourself, then second. And then from, oh yeah, the uh, far back, the lady there. Okay, first your... Uh, Thank you very much. My name is Philip Wells from Demeter Consulting. Um, my question is to, to all of you. First of all, I'd just like to start with a brief explanation. In Indonesia, what, uh, what the Indonesian Ministry of Forestry calls an FMU is, is a landscape level unit which may have, may have a number of what FSC might term FMUs within it. So it might have mixed use, it might have a bit of protection for us, it might have a bit like the landscape in your example. It seems to me that if you want to achieve things at the landscape level, then you need to go to a natural unit of management that exists, which is just beginning to start in the music of Kalpe I'm wondering, my, I suppose my question is, have you been in, in, uh, in the discussion with the Ministry of Forestry to look at the potential and possibility to get certification for Carpe, Carpe Half. As this is, this would enable, uh, this would make all the members within the Carpe Half, all the 
different land users having to um, to, to uh, improve their standards to achieve a certification for the whole landscape. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Felix. For second question. I'm from Kyoto University. Uh, I was very surprised. Uh, my two years uh, study in Dr. Timba, uh, our data can, can contribute uh, this FSC FOE, FRC, yes. And uh, but my question is uh, how to get the pro profit for this FORC, yes. Uh, because, uh, for example, in case of Dr. Timba, uh, the most of, most of the product is prior, and uh, most of the priority is exporting to Japan, but uh, uh, all, the, all the other certified clients, only 10% of their production, uh, because other, com other Japanese companies uh, don't want to, they, of course they buy a prior from Rata, but they do not give a premium, they just buy others. Normal prior. Uh, the reason is why. Uh, the reason is uh, FSC is still not, not so popular in Japan, and uh, of course there is a strong pressure for Japanese government to reduce uh, tropical timber. So the Japanese government, uh, uh, the, the policy of Japanese government to reduce to impose the tropical timber. Uh, do not care about uh, if it's certified or uh, not certified. So actually, the volume of truck timber importing from Indonesia and Malaysia already increased, but because the government do not uh, do not uh, promote do not, do not, do not, do not uh, ask the trading company to select a certified timber. Uh, it's a, Trading companies still importing uh, uh, prior from Indonesia and Malaysia uh, do not care about the FSC certification. So I guess still only a few percent of uh, prior from Indonesia and Malaysia is certified. Even, even so many companies, in Indonesia, more than 10 companies in Indonesia already doing the FSC certification, they cannot stay. To Japan as a certified prior, they just said uh, also that prior they said to Japan still no certified. So how is there any uh, strategies how to promote the uh, certified prior uh, to uh, Jap Japan's market? Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Najima. Samijima, thank you. And the third question from the back, yes. This lady in the back here. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Hi, I'm making the tour from Columbia University. I'm also a student for another new job here in Indonesia. And this idea of um, kind of mismatched spatial skills has come up a number of times, um, both because the FSC project is nested within a larger landscape, but also because these ecosystem processes that support ecosystem services are functioning kind of at different spatial scales from one another. So I'm wondering if, um, on the market side of this, how you um, plan on dealing with that? So will you bundle these services together, sell them as a unit, or will you kind of parse them out and subdivide them, and sell them that way, or and, and how? Okay, thank you. And uh, I will invite Vita and uh, us here. Like to answer the question? Well, uh, from the first question, uh, uh, to report by Mr. Felix, yeah? uh, he was mentioning Kapiha. Kapiha is a forest management unit that is uh, an, uh, an area designated for uh, forest management in a production as well as in a conservation and uh, in a protection forest. And I think uh, it is a, a policy from the Ministry of Forestry 
to divide all the uh, forest area in Indonesia into uh, FMU or we call it into KPH. So the question was that uh, the forest project uh, has been uh, any discussion with the Ministry of Forestry on the uh, certification at KPH level. Is that correct? developing KPH, but unfortunately the process is really slow, while in this project we have a timeline that we need to catch. Um, so in relation to this KPH, the forestry service in that district, we help the community to create a special delineation of their working area. Uh, residential area and the forest area and that we propose that to the Kapeha so that the Kapeha can recognize them inside the whole Kapeha spatial regulations. Well, uh, just for additional information that uh, even though that the project was not uh, let's say, uh, a frame into a, a certain Kapeha, but uh, by location, the project site, I mean, it is already located in a Kapeha areas. Uh, for example, in uh, Lombok, it is belong to Kapeha Rinjani, and also the uh, uh, Kapuas Hulu uh, project site, uh, as Tita mentioned, that the uh, district government is no uh, developing or establishing the KPH Kapasulu, but it's not uh, established yet. But later, the project will, of course, uh, adopt it as an uh, KPH uh, activities. So that's uh, what can I add to the uh, Tita's answer. Yeah. So that's the second question. Second question. Yes. So on the question about the market in Japan, it's a really good question. So. Um, FSC is a market-based tool and the way it works is that we, we create with partners a market for certification. So that's why you have that, that curve of the growth in the supply chain is that as the market wants more and more certification, wants more and more certified products, then you can get that exponential growth because the demand then pulls the supply. So, um, but we're not a marketing agency, we're an NGO, so we work with partners um, to try and create additional market, additional market pool. We have ourselves, we have a team uh, called the Key Account Management Team, who work with companies mainly. Um, and in this region, we work all over the region, including in Japan, with um, leading companies that are specifying forest products. And traditionally, or historically, that's been the major way by which the market has grown, is by working with specifiers, with retailers, or with big brands. So we work, for instance, in Japan, we're working with OG, OG Paper, we're working with Mitsubishi, we're working with Aeon, Aeon Group. So um, and we work directly with them through our FSC office in Japan, uh, but also with partners such as WWF um, and SAFE in Indonesia with TDI. Um, and we try and create these partnerships and try to create these relationships to, to improve the demand from these businesses. Um, through that, we can then also do awareness raising with consumers. Um, we can try and raise the uh, awareness amongst consumers. But we need to, to do that. We need to have the products on shelves. We need to have the products available. So what we've done in Japan over the last couple of years is we've invested money from FSC International into FSC Japan to run a, an awareness campaign and to understand the market better. It's very different in Japan to say Hong Kong or very different to Germany. We found that the market there needs different drivers in order to change it. So we're investing now in our own resources in there, but also working with partners in the most appropriate ways to try and get the market more sensitized. And what we've seen is that in certain parts of Asia, we have a very fast growth in consumer awareness. So now in Hong Kong, we're at 36% consumer awareness on the FSC label. 
And so it's increasingly you known. It's gone from 11% you know, a couple of years ago. And that's by working with partners and working with brands and working with companies. So in Europe, you know, 70, 60% consumer awareness. In Japan, we're down to 10. So we need to work to get up. But we do that by working with these partnerships and working with our team. Thank you very much. I just wanted to add related to uh, this situation of a country like Japan, and we have the same tendency in many countries in Europe where there's a, a move away from wanting to buy tropical timber. Um, and there's not a, a real big market for it anymore, and the market is certainly going down. Um, I think discussions like the one we're having here, looking at ecosystem services as part of what we we uh, include in certification of tropical timber, I think is hugely important for that because that sort of downturn on the market comes very much out of a skepticism and a fear of tropical deforestation. And if we can actually begin much cle more clearly documenting that a certified product from a tropical country actually produces at the same time ecosystem services in terms of water, biodiversity, local social issues, then I think it would be much, much easier to actually counter that sort of campaign against a tropical timber. And I think it would be very important to be able to document these impacts more clearly and to uh, make sure that they get part of what the whole conversation is around certified timber and other products from the uh, tropics. Okay. Thank you, Kim, for the additional information. And the last question was, uh, uh, I think, Alessia, if you want to, to uh, answer it. It was on the question of scale and, and how you could apply FT certification at different scales. And at the moment, yes, we have a, uh, most of the certification is at pretty much at the FME level or the forest level. Um, but there is no reason why FC certification can't be done at a bigger scale. You just have to include that in the scope of the evaluation. So um, in some cases, we do include um, non-forest land as part of that evaluation. We include communities, we include sawmills, we include other, other activities. And that is looked at as part of the audit process. Um, but what you need to do is you define the scope of the audit process and then you evaluate it against the principles and criteria. And as long as you can evaluate against the principles and criteria, then you can do the certification. So it can be at a bigger scale than just the forest. You can include communities, you can include agriculture. Things that you can actually verify using the standard would be limited to what the standard can actually look at. Does, does that answer the question? A little bit. I guess I meant how is it? How do you make sure that it's consistent with the, process, the ecosystem processes that are actually providing the different ecosystem services? Particularly if you're looking at multiple ecosystem services that you know that happen at different scales within one project. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that, as we discussed before, that, that can be difficult with, with different ecosystem services, and that's one of the things that the project is looking at trying to develop indicators that will capture that. But it's going to be different for different things. So for water, it's going to be very different to carbon or for ecotourism. So we're trying to define the indicators so that we can try and get that scale included into the evaluation. Also, so it's practical and auditable. Because it's all well and good to have great standards. But if you can't even use them on the field, then they don't work. So it's, it's field testing those, getting into work, changing them, consulting, getting the local buy-in, I hope that's answering your question. And if not, then you can have a bilateral talk then later on after the session. So I will invite another question from uh, in front rows, yours, and then second yourself and yourself. Three uh, questions. Yeah? Uh, hi, my name is Astrid from HSB Indonesia. And one of the financing we have uh, in the timber and logging companies are 100% FAC certified by the end of the year. This is for HSBC globally. And I, I want to ask a very simple question. Is there a practical way? Because I know in FSC website you have the name of the companies that are already FSC certified. But given that the requirement is the 100% certification, especially for the chain of custody, is there a practical or suggestion that you can give me to basically identify the name of the companies that already achieved 100% FSC certification? Because sometimes they only have probably 25%, the rest 
are coming from unsustainable sources and we would like to know that before giving funds to these companies. Unfortunately, the information is provided as it could, could be improved for, for, for the interest of the, of the financing institutions in the way the names. And on the other hand, that source can also be used for targeting the companies that we think are sustainable. Yeah, so. Uh, no, let the uh, wits for the other <laughs> question. Your turn. Yes. Hi, I'm Mariana Rufino from C4, based in Kenya. Uh, if certification of ecosystem services is going to move to the landscape level, and there are organizations uh, looking at certification of uh, agricultural capital, so I was wondering whether FSC is already talking to, the, to those who are certifying agricultural products and how this benefit from ecosystem services will be shared. The, a very easy example is forest providing water to agricultural land uses around the forest. So, uh, and there are products that are certified, agricultural products, say tea or coffee. So how could this benefit from the ecosystem services be shared between those who protect the forest and those who practice agriculture? Thank you, Mariana. And the third question? I'm Tom Maduro from Bogor Agriculture University, Faculty of Forestry. I have two uh, comments or questions. First, if we are doing sustainable forest management, say a certain uh, forest management unit, and this forest management unit, uh, say they got this FSC certificate. So I think in that particular forest management unit, they have already also passed uh, these so-called forces. If they are doing sustainable forest management in that particular uh, forest management unit, say production forest, I think they already produce environmental service in a sustainable manner also. I understand there are some cases that uh, forces being done in, not in a, say, for, uh, production forest area. So please uh, clarify my understanding about this. And the second thing, uh, with regard to the forest certification, again, one uh, forest management unit got the uh, FSC certificate. It means that that particular forest management unit has been assessed and then uh, given forest certificate. And I understand that this certification valid only for a certain period of time, say five years. So what happens, say in the case in Indonesia, a forest management unit has already passed, uh, got uh, FSC certificate. And then after five years, this particular one, one in the, in the process, they fail. What does it mean? In relation to the sustainable forest management, because this is only good for say a certain period of time, say five years, and then no more. I don't think that's sustainable forest management. And how could you guarantee for each and every uh, forest management unit that has passed and got FSC certificate eventually? they will really do sustainable forest uh, sustainable forest management. Thank you. Thank you, Makogu, for your questions. I think I would like to invite uh, us here first to give the answers. Okay. So, uh, HSBC, thank you for the question. Um, so, HSBC have a very strong policy on investing in companies that are sustainable, and they specify the C as the, the, the goal for that. Um, in terms of forest management, 
Um, it's very easy to see with FSC certification whether something is certified because you can look on the web and you can see the whole report. It's all very transparent. You can see all the non conformities and everything else. Um, what HSBC is now saying as well is if they're investing in companies in the supply chain that are buying and selling the certified products and sharing close to companies, then they also need to be FSC certified, um, which is good. However, if you're FSC certified in the supply chain, it doesn't necessarily mean that everything you sell is FSC certified. You can buy and sell non FSC products. You have to be acting legally and you have to be complying with certain norms, but you, you can actually sell products that could be unsustainable. Um, and at the moment, FSC doesn't have a mechanism by where HSBC or anybody else can see what percentage of the companies in the supply chain um, are selling as FSC certified or not. Um, and we've looked at that over the years, and yeah, the, the way the work system works at the moment is because it's a market based system, and it's very difficult for us to impose that onto a company. Um, essentially, what we say to them is if you know, the more market demand is, then the more they'll sell. The more benefit is, but if there's no market demand, then they won't sell anything. So at the moment, you can't see that. Um, but you can see all the company names, they're all listed on the website, and you can see um, what's in their scope of certification, so what they, they're allowed to buy and sell. Um, and I'm sure you could go to them directly and say, it's about your investment strategy, what percentage are you selling? And they can choose to tell you or not, and that's the business to business relationship for you. I don't know if we. I'm not aware of any plans for that to change. Um, on the second question on how we link up with other types of certification. So um, we do work with other certifications quite a lot. We're all part of most of the certification systems. The credible ones are part of something called ICL, which is an international standards and co-labor and accreditation and settlement body. And Fair Trade and Marine Stewardship Council are part of that as well as Gold Standard. Um, and we try and collaborate as much as we can with those other systems to try and harmonize the way the certifications are undertaken and to try and make the systems as compatible as possible so there's no overlap uh, on the field. And also so that when certifications are undertaken, um, it's done at the lowest cost possible. So that, for instance, if you're evaluating the same thing for different systems, you don't have to evaluate it twice. The same one is just going to evaluate it. <coughs> and so in trying to work with the supply chain, say for agricultural products, We've had a project with Fair Trade, whereby we've also um, looked at dual certification with Fair Trade internationally, but how FSC would look at the forest management part, Fair Trade would look at the fairness part, collaborating together so that you can actually um, get that benefit from working together. So some people want Fair Trade, some people want FSC, and you can get both. But it's quite tricky to do because the system is very different, you know, different things. Similarly with, um, if you're looking at um, carbon, um, it's, it's with the gold standard is that the skill sets of the auditors are very different when you're evaluating forest management to when you're evaluating carbon. And if you want to train auditors to be able to do both, that's going to cost a lot of money. And we might actually have these super auditors who can do every single thing. So you might need to collaborate with other systems in order to make the thing viable and credible. Um, so yes, we're trying to do it. It's not as easy as it may seem. Um, but I think there is scope to move forward, particularly when we're looking at communities and landscapes, for people making FSC in a way more fair, and fairing up FSC. Because the moment FSC is mainly about good forest management and, and then traceability to a retail. And there's lots of people looking, well, how much can we include of social issues, of fairness issues in our supply chain? And we're doing a lot of work with communities and smallholders. At the moment, to try and get work on that. At the moment, we have a new project which is called the Small Community Label Option, whereby if you are a community or a smallholder, then you can use a different label on a product, which is so an FSC level with additional messaging, additional branding, and we're now using that in some markets to try and sell and create incentives for communities to be certified. And so it's, it's starting to fare up that part of the supply chain. And uh, I can send you some uh, messaging around it. It's quite interesting. And I think that will continue. And uh, there's a lot of interest in FSC to move more in that direction of getting more social issues and more fairness issues into what we do. Well, then, 
the third question from Papa Wu. So, so, yes, a lot of the existing services parts have already looked at in the evaluation. However, um, at the moment we don't have specific indicators to verify that those existing services and indicators themselves are being evaluated properly. So, um, let's try to give you an example. Um, say, for instance, for uh, water, yes, if you are uh, certified, you should be looking into the water, but we haven't quantified what that benefit is. Same with carbon, we don't quantify what the carbon benefit is as part of our evaluation. In order to be able to market those or get a payment for those, you need to be able to say what the actual value of the ecosystem service is and you'd be evaluated. So the indicators will help us to create that tool or that metric to be able to measure in that forest what the value of that ecosystem service is. On top of the fact that it's sustainable and responsible, then you can also say sustainable and responsible plus has this dollar value for water, this dollar value for carbon, this dollar value for tourism. Then you can try and get a payment for that. So it's providing an additional source on top. And also what it does is it tries to create uh, the market incentives to then to be able to sell those products. So like FC does, we create market incentives to sell sustainable forest products. And that works, that drives the system. And what we want to be able to do is to try and create market incentives to sell those ecosystem services products on top. Does that answer the question? Taking the point from uh, yes. Bartogo questions, that does it uh, automatically for uh, any M uh, FMU who already got the FSC uh, certificate would be certified as uh, environmental services as well? Right. This, the claims you make are what's evaluated. So if you can claim you are responsible and are managed, you wouldn't be able to make claims that we have quantifiably measured this amount of water, or this amount of carbon, or this amount of biodiversity. For that, you need to do additional checks. And that's what these indicators do. So they allow you to check those additional factors to provide something quantifiable. Is that answer your question? Thank you. And on the five year part, so um, this is the certification is only for five years. Um, actually, you do the audit. Initially, and it takes a while to get certified first, so it's usually a pre-assessment and a main assessment. And then you have non compliances and then you comply with those non compliances before you get certified. And once you're certified, you don't automatically have five years. You're checked every year, or in some cases every six months, for continued compliance with the standards. So the independent auditors will come back and check the continued compliance for the through. And at the end of the five years, they'll come back and do a full evaluation against the whole standard. Um, but there's no point where you say, okay, we're certified now, we get to five years, and then we can drop off, you'll be continually checked. We do, we do struggle with the term sustainable, um, and we, we usually use the term responsible. Yeah. I, I think it is really interesting, but look at the nature of what we are doing. What we are doing is that we are making a check on what the manager or the owner of a piece of land does on that land. That check can only be for a period, it cannot be forever, because we do not know that that owner will do the same in five years or in 10 years or in 20 years. And we cannot know that that owner will be the same owner in five years or in 10 years or in 20 years. So it's very difficult for us on that basis to actually make sure that the level of sustainability will indeed continue. I think for that to happen, we need to complement what we can do with the marketplace mechanism and directly engaging with the owner with what the legislation needs to do. I think the legislation needs to make sure that there are a basic requirements for forest management that ensure sustainability. I don't think we can do that in an agreement with the current owner of a piece of land. And that, that's one of the limitations that I think our system will always have. But what we can do is that we can actually check that in the current situation, we have a responsible forest management, which will actually 
have the potential of ensuring sustainability in the long run. We can ensure that we are on the right track at the moment, and at least we can then check that every every year uh, through the certification system. Increasingly, um, as he started, is it in a way as a failure of governments to be able to regulate um, government forest convention. So it's created a civil society and business working together. And we created this tool which can be used on a temporal basis to evaluate what's happening in the forest at that particular time. But as we're developing, we've been around for 20 years, and that tool has been used and it's been used quite successfully to measure things over that time. I think for governments are now looking at our tool and thinking, well, that's useful. We're looking at governments saying, well, we can't solve all the problems on our own, really. We're on at all. So we're working more closely together with governments and projects and forces. And also on other things, such as uh, illegal timber legislation, fighting or being in timber regulations. And all these things we have to work together and become part of a thing that's trying to do things on a wider scale. So governments, so society and culture seems to have us. We need to work to be able to have that impact on the range of issues going forward in the future. Do you have you any other terms then? So I think uh, your uh, concern would be uh, taken as a, a note for uh, FSC as well as for other uh, stakeholders. Yeah. In terms of sustainable, according to FSC, the certification is still on the equation now. And we will take note of it. So uh, I think we still have uh, five minutes. Uh, Yes, please. One question only, yeah? Because time is very limited. We only have uh, five minutes before we come to the end. All right. Um, hi, thank you. I'm Wesley from the Singapore Economic Development Board. Uh, I'd just like to ask the panel, like, um, currently, a certification at the landscape level it seems quite new, and that it seems like currently it's at NGOs like WWF and FSC, who is driving the settings of the framework, uh, the methodology and the indicators. How do you all see uh, the role of companies uh, in landscape level certification and management? And, and do you all see them uh, coming on board with you? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, perhaps I'll say first, and then Dita will give an additional information in the recent case. Yeah, I think we, you know, as, I, as I mentioned before, it's companies who have been the main driver with FC certification in the past. So we do see interest from companies that are looking at the wider right landscape level. And you look at the commitments being made by people like HSBC, or by Unilever, or by Nestle, uh, or by ADP. You know, they're looking at a uh, broader level uh, in the landscape in terms of how they want to go forward. So yes, I think we will be supporting them. But it will depend company to company on what their particular objectives are and what type of impact that they have. Yeah. Um, well, I would like to go back to the statement that I made in my presentation, saying that uh, if we relate this to the forces project, then uh, forces as the additional or for the expansion for the FSC certification. And one of the reasons why we are doing it, because right now there's a very limited appreciation for uh, forest management unit or companies, uh, in particular the, the active logging company, where they already preserve the forestry services or the ecosystem services, but there is no uh, proper appreciation of that. Just, just add, um, if you look at 
I tried to do forest management in Indonesia and Malaysia. I tried to make money um, from timber. Um, often the opportunity costs of doing other activities such as palm oil or other, other agricultural activities or mining may be a lot higher. So the finances don't work. Um, in order to make that a viable business option, um, it shows some of the numbers there, these services can help in that, in that business case, particularly if you're looking at the longer term. So um, by being able to quantify that with certification, it allows you to then uh, monetize that to some extent, which helps you with decision making about whether you're going to convert your land to forest to your part or not. Um, and the same can be true with in many other cases of benefit commodities. Um, by broadening the scope, uh, we think we can use FSC as a tool to actually have more of an impact in protecting forests, but also protecting the livelihoods of communities who rely on those forests. And companies need to help. Well, Tim, perhaps we have a final say before we close the session. Well, I can certainly say that I, I do believe that a number of companies are quite interested in looking beyond timber as the uh, main issue related to tropical forests. We see a very big interest in looking at deforestation as a much wider issue. I think if you begin to look at deforestation, you are more or less automatically also beginning to look at the ecosystem services involved. Uh, in that, because why do you want to provide deforestation that is exactly in order to make sure that the ecosystem services can still be provided, meaning carbon, meaning water, meaning biodiversity, uh, plus a number of the social issues involved also. So I think there is in fact a lot of interest out there in this issue, and I think the main challenge that we have is to be able to find ways in which we can document what we are already doing that is relevant in this context, and this is uh, uh, quantifying the water issues, quantifying the carbon issues, quantifying and documenting the social issues. I think that is hugely important. And then to move certification to become a tool that is also relevant for larger scale uh, landscapes than just the, the individual forest management unit. Thank you, Kim. Uh, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, I think we are now coming to the end of uh, our session. And uh, what uh, we can learn from our uh, discussion today is that uh, ecosystem services is uh, becoming more important uh, considering the wider uh, benefits that can be uh, gained.